In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we answer fitness and health questions asked by listeners like you. But the first 40 minutes of this episode is the introductory portion. This is where we talk about what happens in our lives. We mention studies revolved around fitness or other things. Sometimes we mention our sponsors. So let me give you a breakdown of the whole episode. So the intro portion is where we start. We start by talking about Father's Day. That just happened. All of us are dads, including Doug. So we talk about what we did over the weekend with our families. Then we talk about some COVID conspiracies. There's a lot of them out there. But the one we mention mm. right now is really strange. You'll it's actually, real. Go do this. You'll actually be able to test this out yourself. Uh, then we talk about statistics uh, in households without fathers. Dads are extremely important. Be involved in your children's lives. The statistics don't lie. Children who grow up with fathers and mothers do far better than children who grow up in single-parent households. Uh, then we talk about how Justin is the fan favorite, <laughs> starting to make us feel a little insecure over here. Yeah, you guys. Then I talked about the best dads in movies. Uh, mentioned some of the movie dads out there that are great role models for us. Yeah, uh, Magnum P.I. <laughs> then we talk about cardboard fans. Apparently sports are coming back. And uh, But people are not watching them live, and yet they're putting cardboard cutouts of themselves in the stands. Sounds weird, but Brilliant. It's, kind of, it's a great idea, in my opinion. Then we talk about social media, how a lot of people seem to be leaving social media because it's so stressful uh, right now. And in general, life seems to be full of anxiety and stress. Now, there's a lot of ways you can work on managing stress, which is real important for your health and your mindset. One of the things you can do is use full-spectrum hemp oil extract, which is high in CBD. You can take this product. The one we work with is Ned. We like them the best. And it will alleviate the physical symptoms of anxiety, meaning physically speaking, you start to feel more calm, which changes uh, how you perceive things. It can improve your sleep, just make you feel generally better. It is an over-the-counter product. It is natural, and in, it, it is quite safe. Again, the company we work with is Ned. They're one of the only companies we know of that make full-spectrum hemp oil extract, meaning it's got everything in there, not just the CBD, but all the other cannabinoids and terpenes and all the stuff that works together to make you feel good. Now, if you want to try Ned out just to see how good a real CBD product can be, go to helloned.com. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com forward slash mind pump. And if you use the code mind pump, you'll get 15% off your first order. And then we talk about working out in the morning versus working out in the evenings, the, 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 the pros and cons of each. Then we got into answering the questions. The first question, this person wants to know about booty bands and hip circles. Are they effective for building the butt? The second question, this person wants to know if rest days are actually important or if you can just work out every single day real hard. The third question, this person has some nagging pain that goes away when they work out but then comes back later on when they cool down, uh, what's going on? And the final question, this person wants to know how far the pendulum swings for us in terms of our fitness and our health. Like how far is that swing? What do we do to get back on track? Also, all month long, uh, one of our best calorie burning programs, so if it's summer's coming up, and or actually in summer actually, and if you want to burn body fat, and you have a history of exercise, and you want to burn the most calories possible in a workout with a routine that doesn't cause you to lose muscle, but does help you burn body fat, you can try MAPS HIT. HIT stands for High Intensity Interval Training. So this is HIT training with weights. It's extremely effective. It's 50% off right now only. Here's how you get the discount. Go to MAPSHIT.com. That's M-A-P-S-H-I-I-T.com and use the code HIT. 50. That's H I I T 50, no space for the discount. By the way, this routine is home gym friendly. You don't need a lot of equipment to do it. Go check it out. And it's t shirt time. Oh, shit, Doug. You know it's my favorite time of the week. Oh, yeah. That yeah. sounded angry. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That was rough. Wow. 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 <laughs> All right. We have uh, three winners for Apple Podcasts and one winner for Facebook. The Apple Podcast winners are Elijah Leve and Kristen Renee 22 and B Mockin. For Facebook, we have John Potts. All of you are winners. Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. 
Include your shirt size and your shipping address, and we'll get that shirt right out to you. Douglas, we got the red light. Yes, the red we light's on. We got the red light. How, um... Roxanne! Wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> that, wow. Was for you, that was for you, Justin. I love that. Mm-hmm. That came out nice. Man. Happy Father's Day. Rings <laughs> just in my ear. I love it. <laughs> got you all. How, uh, how are the best dads that I know? How'd you guys have... How uh, was your Father's Day? By the way, you had such a sweet post. I got all emotional. Did you really? I did. I did. That, yeah. was, really, that, was, that was really sweet of you. It's true. Yeah, it's, I meant it. I meant every word of it. You guys are great fathers. Did I ever tell you guys about the time that I realized that Doug was such an amazing dad? Um, I believe no. so. I don't think so. So I tell me. I trained Doug was my client uh, for a while, and um, you know, we, it, you talk with your clients about your family and stuff, and he would talk a lot about his. He always he would talk about his daughter quite a bit, mm-hmm. and how much he loved her and how great she is. And but I didn't know much about his history or whatever. She came in one day and um, she doesn't look like Doug at all, right? Uh, yeah. She no, she's you know Doug is Caucasian. She's half Asian, half African American. Looks nothing like him. I realized at that moment that Doug essentially adopted her, but I never knew the story. I never knew how he was always so patient. Always talk about how much he loved her, and it's wonderful to hear that and then to see. And it wasn't something that he ever brought up. It wasn't a big deal. No, I I, yeah. I remember the same thing, and I was super confused because I remember I'd seen his ex, and she's Asian, and then I'm like, wait a second, this doesn't make sense yeah. at all right now. Yeah. <laughs> how did this happen, Doug? You do know, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the old milkman trick, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's and, and when I saw that, and I knew he never made it like he shouldn't, right? I thought, wow, what a great, uh, what a great guy, what a nice guy. But you guys are, you guys are excellent fathers. I love watching you guys with your kids and hear you guys talk. Yeah. What'd you guys do this you weekend, too, man? What'd you guys do? Oh, we actually oh, had a great, had a great time with the kids. I actually took them. Uh, I wanted to go frisbee golfing, and oh, I love that. Yeah, I have. I kept talking to them about it, and I didn't know how it was going to go because, you know, like. Uh, with kids, it's like you go to throw something in, like it's going to get lost in like two seconds, you know? And so we had a great time though. We were just like throwing and blazing through all these uh, trails and stuff and like hiking through it. So it's a great time uh, actually being outdoors and doing all that. So we did that and we set off some rockets. So, Oh, I saw that. Now are these legit rockets or are they the water ones? No, legit. Like not C4, but like C6 or some kind of like C4 explosive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I set off a few of them and, uh, you know, like <laughs> one of them landed like way off t- to like on top of this person's house. And we're just like, well, that one's gone. <laughs> I'm not going to go try and, you know, get that one back. I did that a lot as a kid. I was really into the rock. So did I. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah really- so did you, did you waste your money on the one that took a picture? Oh no, I'd never have one. Like so that. I, I used to go to the hobby store cause I had an uncle that was into it and he got me into it. And so when you go to the hobby store, you see the different levels of rockets, right? The beginner one. Then there's the one with like three stage engines or whatever, and it goes the highest. Dang. Then there was this really expensive one that had like three or four stages into it, and and it also had a camera. Now remember, this is back in the early '90s. Okay, so it's not like the, the high tech, you know, <laughs> it's digital like, camera. It's all like blurry, so yeah. and just blue sky. Yeah, dude. <laughs> and so what it's supposed to do is it goes up, and then at the top it takes a picture. What a waste of money. Oh man, that's sick. That's like, like Polaroid technology, right? Yeah. It's yeah. Like, what are you taking a picture of? Not, I see like sky, a little bit of horizon. What a waste. <laughs> what a total waste. Yeah. But they were a lot of fun. They're still fun. Yeah, so how, cool. how about your Father's Day? Uh, oh, it was great, man. I went up. Uh, I went up to the Tahoe place, and this was my first time um, golfing on that uh, course. So absolutely amazing. I didn't know this. So my, my best friend Justin, big time golfer. His brother uh, is like a badass golfer, and then his dad likes to golf. And so for Father's Day, we invited them up. So they came up. They met. They drove up in the morning. They met us uh, at the course, and then we went and played. And then when we were playing. I guess the uh, PGA tour is coming through there. Mm. So the course, obviously, anytime PGA is coming through a course, or if they get selected as a course, the course already has to be really nice. And then the course like takes it to another level. So it's just, it's so pristine. I mean, even the the uh, tee boxes where you know you're used to seeing you know divots and what's uh, a tee box? Yeah, that's where you hit off. So you hit yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it's you normally try. you know chunks of grass. I mean, everything is like. Sp- manicure yes perfect it's yeah. like somebody is coming out there with like scissors and fingernail clippers <laughs> every day to make sure like every blade of grass is perfect huh. so it was gore and it was a beautiful 75 degrees 
you know, no wind really, just a night, beautiful, beautiful day. And, and you guys are just golfing the whole time. Yeah, I'm now, terrible. Now, golf takes a long time, right? It's all day. Oh, yeah. four. Well, four four hours, four and a half hours or so. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, depending on it how makes you... makes sense now why so many husbands golf. <laughs> oh, that's it. Oh, yeah. One hundred. I remember after the first oh, I picked time up I... a new hobby. You know, I'll be yeah. gone all day. Yeah. For <laughs> sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah, for dinner. And you and you can tell, like, all the wives never, like, have, like, the exact time. Because you don't have to drive to a course, too. And then you have lunch and everything like that. So it is. It's just... If you ask like most wives, they'd be like, golf is a 10 hour sport. <laughs> yeah. I think every husband does that. It's just like, hey, I'm golfing on Sunday yeah. with the guys. It's that in the bowling league. Yeah. 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 Those kind of died off. Yeah. But I'll be gone from Saturday, you know, AM to I went, we went to the park. So the, the kids uh, and Jessica uh, and I went to the park and hung out and threw the frisbee and told funny stories and just had a great time. It's so nice to just, just to be with your family and, and you know, with your kids and, the whole thing. The park, believe it or not, was I thought it might be super busy, but I guess people are still scared, you know, mm. to kind of go anywhere. So it was still pretty quiet. Dude, speaking of scared of COVID stuff, I was tripping out on what you told me about putting in three numbers. Yeah, isn't that it, weird? That is that is way weird. So somebody posted it and I tested it. So this is what you do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Ty- try you, this. You could type any three numbers. I don't it doesn't matter what they are. One one one. You could do whatever you want. You post them in the search function of Google and then after the three numbers put uh, new cases and then hit search and no matter what three numbers you you hit you're going to get an article talking about COVID yeah like Alabama had six you know 111 new cases today or you know Iran had whatever number you put in will come up with an article to back it up or whatever. Yeah. Is that weird? Yeah. That is weird. Or am I just tripping? Yeah. Or am I just tripping? No. Is That's that just engineered. <laughs> it's not weird. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I- I'm beyond all that. Like, oh, this is strange. Like, no, this is like totally yeah. like made on purpose. Yeah. Well, speaking of conspiracy theories that, pro- that are turning out to be true, Adam. Uh, <laughs> Me? Yeah, ju- yeah. No, no. Justin, oh, we're deep in this. Justin uh, legit is the favorite. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Oh, wait, what? There's we have no- so much ed- evidence now that the fans <laughs> prefer Justin to be you and I. They disliked my pose better than you guys. No, dude. Yeah, no. I, I, the, I gave them the uh, people's eyebrow. Yeah, yeah right. Like, hey. No, we did a post for Father's Day, and it was a picture of all of us. I thought we all looked pretty good. Yeah. Justin got all the love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm actually drilling something too, you know. No, it was your being handy. It was your, you know, rock impression with the yeah. eyebrow up and the like, the kind of like I don't know what face that is. I have no idea. Is that your old face? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess so. I was like trying to pretend that I was like uh, this romance novel yeah. guy. Like, yeah, I got <laughs> DMs over it, you know, <laughs> about about Justin. Yeah. Hey, hey, Adam. Uh, wow. <laughs> you know, yeah. Justin apparently personally. that's that's the move. I I gotta remember that. Yeah. No, we yeah. can't. We we gotta stop explaining it away with the oh, it's his eyebrow. No, it's yeah. no, he's just. Bottom line. I got no love oh. for uh, lawn mowing the the artificial turf, so that didn't. Yeah. Get oh yeah, Let's, <laughs> I, people. Yeah, come on. I thought for sure me washing dishes would get a lot of love, but nobody cared. Yeah, <laughs> nobody cared at all. Yeah, I was like, what do I got? Sad story. What do I got to do to be you know to be yeah. the favorite? Hey, anyway. speaking of Father's Day and so that, what was, step was, your sex? Sal, do you remember what the stat was that I remember we talked about? Like, um, you know, what as far as. A, a child's success, um, everything from uh, education to even like financial success, uh, it like one of the number one determining factors is a a father figure in their life. Is that correct? Yeah. So if you grow up in a two parent household, um, your odds of success are, and this is just across the board. However, you want to determine success, so wealth. Or, you know, did you end up in prison, uh, how you did with your education, obesity, like doesn't matter how you slice it. If you have a father in the home or you grew up in a two-parent household, um, you the odds of, of success uh, are significantly higher. This is the single biggest predictor of how a kid will turn out. Do you guys know that? So you could, you could look at wealth, you could look at poverty, you could look at education, uh, religion, race, doesn't matter what you look at, none of those predict as nearly, they don't even come close to predicting with the same accuracy as whether or not you grew up with a with two parents in the home or specifically uh, with a father. I mean, I have a few statistics that I actually pulled up. So 63% of youth suicides happen with kids who grew up without a father. Wow. Mm. 90% of all homeless and runaway youth, 90% doesn't have a father. 
85 wow. percent of all children that exhibit behavioral disorders are children who come from fatherless homes. 71 percent of all high school dropouts. These are big numbers. We're not mm-hmm. talking like small yeah. small numbers. 70 percent of juveniles in state operated institutions. 75 percent of adolescents who who are uh, who have substance abuse issues who are in substance abuse centers don't have uh, d- were raised in a house without a father. 75% of rapists um, didn't grow up in a house without fathers. Wow. Just terrible. Shit. It is very and, – and this is important to communicate because I think there's uh, – fathers are very important. They're very, very important. And sometimes I think it gets – we don't uh, talk about that as much. Moms are very important, but I think everybody knows that. Right. Yeah. I think when it comes to dads, we're kind of like, eh, it's not, that, not as big of a deal, not as important. It's extremely important. Well, somewhere around you know the line there in media, it was portrayed uh, like like if you watch like Mary with Children, if you watch like you know Homer Simpson, if you like, there's just this there was this plague of portrayals of these characters where the the dad was like just a real piece of shit, and that just yeah. became this this ongoing joke that uh, you know you, you just didn't see that growing up. You didn't see a lot of examples of you know good fathers doing you know, great things for their family and being really involved in, you know, a part of, of the family dynamic. It was just not, uh, you know, something that, you know, like a lot of people grew up with that. And so it was just interesting to me to see how that shifted, uh, you know, the last decade or so. Well, popular media uh, shows, like, like if you're a, a guy growing up in, you know, America right now, you think the 40-year-old dude that has no kids, never married, makes a lot of money, drives a fast car, taking pictures with different girls all the time, that's the guy that's cool. Right. And the dad, well, that's a dork. He's mm. a sellout. He's an idiot. Like, mm. what do you what you, you got kids and you're married? Mm. Why don't you be like this guy over here who never grew up and is, you know, still banging. Yeah, yeah. you what know. What do you call that? Peter Pan syndrome. Peter, that's yeah, actually right. there's a term for that. Yeah. And this is for men who fail uh, to grow up, but we we glamorize it. You know, it used to not be that way. It used to be not that long ago. Like you go back 50, 60, 70 years, 100 years ago and beyond, men would brag about how many children they had. Like how many kids? Oh, you have 3. I got 5. It's like a, it was a source of it was a source of pride. Right. Now you got four kids. You tell another guy that you know how many kids you have four. They're like, oh man, they say so, you're so, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. sorry about that. You're in prison. <laughs> yeah, right. it's, no. it's really strange, yeah. isn't it? It's very, very strange. And then you know the law. Um, uh, you know, in many, in in certain cases, is really if you get divorced and there's a custody battle between mom and dad. Uh, the dad is almost. I mean, it's almost guaranteed to lose if you look at statistics. We're just not considered as important. In fact. And then th- there's this side of it too. Uh, a man who is present in his kids' lives a little bit is praised. You know, oh, he's a good father. He, he, he's with them every other weekend. No, no, he's there. He's definitely involved. Huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you mean he's a good dad because he's there every other weekend? Right. You know, you wouldn't hear people talk about, about moms that way. We play a very special role in, in building uh, successful, healthy uh, adults. Um, and, of course, that plays a role in society. And I think we need to, to celebrate uh, being a father, not make fun of it, like it's like you oh, know, yeah. what happens so often. Now, do you? I, I, and I love asking you guys because you guys, your kids are much older than mine. Do you guys remember like when that kind of like that light bulb went off for you as dads? Like how much of an impression you're making? And I'll give you like we were talking about this. Uh, my best friend and his wife, and just like how the little subtle things that you say or do, and how much that can impact and change a kid. And without you know. Um, throwing them completely under the bus, but we were talking about potty training, right? And they have a two-year-old right now. And I believe that uh, if your kid is not potty trained by three, like uh, daycares won't even take them, things like that. And so you now they have, he's two two years and three months, so they obviously have plenty of time. But it's been like a discussion, like we need to make sure that he's completely potty yeah. trained. So they're talking about, well, one of the things they did maybe a few months ago is when he started like, you know, communicating that he's pooping or he has to go poop or whatever like that. And, you know, just a natural reaction. They, he, they would, he'd say, oh, mommy, I went poop. And if they went poop, they would go, ooh. And they would say things like, oh, gross. Like, and they didn't realize until like maybe like two times after that, he started like hiding. When oh. he had to go. Mm-hmm. And, and they said they just like broke their heart because mm-hmm. they just thought they were being playful with him and saying like, ooh, gross, poop, mm-hmm. you know. 
but that impacted him so much that he started to get like a complex over it. So then when he would have to go, instead of like telling them that, hey, mom, dad, I have to go to the bathroom, he would go hide. Yeah. He would go hide and then go, and they didn't, you know, it didn't dawn on them that that was because of them mm -hmm. and how much of a, a single like little thing like that could totally change his behavior. Oh, and man. it's like, wow, I, how often that happens as a parent? You know, I'm, st I'm just getting into this, so I don't get to see that yet. But it made me really think about, you know, they, you know, I, and my, both of them are incredible parents. And you wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't really dawn on you until that shit gets blown up in your face. But it really starts to make you think of like all oh, the things that you do in front of them or the things that you say to them on how that makes this lasting impression and, and could change them. Oh, dude, it's the, one of the biggest challenges is, as a parent, I'll tell you right now, is being okay with yourself because you can make you make mistakes. Yeah. And then you feel so bad. Right. Like when my when my kid was little, uh, he he went through the stage like he was he was. Out of diapers, but he was, you know, just new, right, with underwear. So he's just new without the diaper thing. And a couple times he he had an accident in bed, and I got upset over one of them, right? I'm like, you can't do this anymore, whatever. And I got really mad at him. Well, one more, it just breaks my, even talking about it breaks my heart. One morning, uh, you know, uh, we wake up or whatever, and he's uh, sitting in the corner. And I'm like, what's the matter, buddy? And he goes, I had an accident, but I put myself in timeout. I was like, oh. Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. I my crushed me. Yeah, oh, yeah, I know. It destroyed me. That's what I mean, right? It's like yeah. a, a little thing like that. You react emotionally because you're like, fuck, I've had to change these damn sheets probably five times already. Yep. And you don't realize that that feeling that you have then transfers into him and then all of a sudden changes his behaviors to do something like that. Totally. You mm -hmm. have a huge impact uh, over your kids. But, you know, I, I tried to stay aware of that. You know, like I try to think to myself, uh, like one, one thing I'm, I, I try to stay aware of is how I treat uh, my my kid's mom or how I treat Jessica in front of them because it teaches my daughter how she should expect to be treated and it teaches my son how to treat women. Mm -hmm. So I always, I, I'll try to think about that and try to be aware. I mean, I'm human because I, so I'm not going to be perfect, mm -hmm. but I always think about that. Like, would I want my daughter to be, tr to you know, be spoken to the way <laughs> she heard me speak to their mom? Or would I want my son to talk to his girlfriend or his wife well, this way you're the, yeah. you don't, you have the daughter justin doesn't have a daughter so well I, yeah I was, that kind of uh, i was trying to think of some things and i and there's been examples of like uh you know with potty training and whatnot but like yeah it, it it's just a funny thought that came to me from you bringing that up like i is in terms of behavior like so i i'm very affectionate with my wife and so every now and then you know like as i'm coming by i'll give her a kiss whatever and then i'll just you know, I'll slap her on the ass every now and then, you know, and then I just say, hey, babe, a good game. You know, that's my thing. It's just kind of a joke. I just slap her ass like I say, good game, you know, and, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, Everett was like walking by one day and just like slaps her in the ass. Good game, mommy. Oh, I, was no. like, oh. I was like, oh, no. Like, I was like, okay, pal, like, that's like my thing, you know, like, but we, we just died laughing about it. But uh, it is, it is like that. Like, they just pick up on all those things. I, I didn't even know he was watching me do that that stuff you know that was yeah. like our little inside joke but well, i yeah. remember sal telling a story when, uh, when we first started podcasting that it, it totally resonated with me thinking now i don't have a daughter but i mean if i did i think this is such an important lesson that you taught me was uh just being that uh over the top man a figure for your daughter like i remember like the daughter the father daughter dance yeah. how you like really go all out and open the door for her and put her mm -hmm. and just you make this big ordeal and i'm and it, you know it really the light kind of light bulb went off for me is like wow you know i don't think there's anything that can help and now we never know where our kids are going to be when they're 20 years old and what kind of decisions or or men they choose but I would think that one of the best ways that you can ensure that she picks a good father is, or a good man in her life is by being that man early on in totally. her life. So, you know, she'll think when she goes out on a date, the, the guy who didn't open the door for her, wasn't polite, didn't like wine and dine her and treat her like a princess. 
you know, her, she'll go revert back whether she realizes it or not subconsciously and remember what it feels like or what she sees with her, her, with her dad and her mom. Totally. And, and then th those will be her standards. And if dad is not someone who goes above and beyond for his wife in front of his daughter or doesn't treat his daughter like a princess, well, I bet the, the chances are that she's not going to search for a guy that's like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I, what, I, what I do, and I know that we say the word princess, I don't treat her like she's royalty because I think that's also uh, not a good idea. But I treat her, I try to be respectful. I try to listen to her. I try to display because what will end up happening is what you do uh, is what they may uh, accept or tolerate from their boyfriend. You know, so if you're like this loud, you know, if you're this guy that likes to punch the wall and yell and be real, whatever, then you may your kid may grow up and accept that behavior from the person they're dating because they're like, oh, my dad did that. You know, that's what my dad was like. That he used to do that kind of stuff, and you can see those kinds of patterns. So I try to model. You know, and that's that. It, I tell you what, nothing will make you more uh, take more responsibility of your own actions than reminding yourself that, oh, my kid's gonna grow up to be like me or expect it or accept this from people yeah. they're around. That reminds you real quick, you know, how you're behaving. Like, oh, I better rein this in a little bit or whatever. Oh yeah, I know, and I'm always checking the boys, like, because uh, I'm very like rough and we we physical and and you know we wrestle and we have rough and tumble and whatnot but uh, i'm also like you know okay mommy is not you know we, we don't share that same thing like, like, <laughs> like you gotta be you know like unless like, our clothes are all off then you that's yeah that if, you, if you catch us doing that that we're just wrestling right <laughs> uh, but yeah like no the whole thing mommy's a mommy's a flower you know like, <laughs> like, we gotta be nice and gentle and you know and like tell mommy like i'm always trying to to model that in terms of like how i talk to courtney and everything and so i'm working on like being a little more uh, gentle not like you know, physical <laughs> like crazy uh because the boys definitely it, it immediately translates uh, to that with well, them so my when my son when my daughter was born you know my son was four so four years apart and he was holding it for the first time holding his sister and he's looking at her and you know you could tell he's so like wow like you know a baby or whatever and the first words out of his mouth as he looks at her and he, he looks up at me and he goes wow she's so sexy and I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like what <laughs> What did you say? He goes, yeah. sexy. I I'm like, do you know what that means? And he goes, cute. Because yeah. he heard me say it. You know, he hear me say it to his mom or whatever. Dude, so hilarious. he didn't know any better, you know? Um, <laughs> so I said, perfect adjective. I, I said, let me, I told him too, and he was that little. I said, I can't wait till you're like 15. I'm going to bring so this. sexy. And today, you know, now now my kids are older and I tell uh, that story. Have you told uh, that to him? Uh, oh, yeah. They, uh, okay, so he does. They laugh and you, know, <laughs> you get super embarrassed. He's like, I didn't know any better. I said, I don't. Oh, that's my God. So, that's hilarious. That's why dude. it's so funny. Yeah. But, you know, Father's Day reminded me of, you know, cool dads in movies. Like, you know, uh, dad, like yeah. badass dads in movies. All right. I wrote a few down that I, that oh, I could let me think hear. of let off, me hear. off the top of my head. So. John Matrix from Commando. That was a that was a badass ass. <laughs> <Or> kid, <laughs> kidnapped Arnold. For yeah, the, they kidnapped Commando? his daughter. Yeah. He fucked the whole thing up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he killed the whole army just to get his daughter back. You know what I mean? They, Na naturally. Do you yeah, remember that when they kid, good when they kidnapped his daughter? Yeah, the yeah. look on his face yeah. like, oh, you're all in trouble. So then Liam Nielsen's got to uh, you know fall into that with Taken. Right? Taken. Do you yeah. remember that scene? Yeah, of course. Where he's like, you know, you know, I know things. And, yeah, uh, yeah, I will use those things. Yeah. To come kill you those if you don't give me. That's my the best scenes ever. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's one of the best. Uh, Marlon from Finding Nemo. What a great dad. Remember that scene? <laughs> when, he's, uh, when he yeah. went to search the whole ocean yeah. for his boy. Yeah. That, that was a good one. That's a good dad. Another, another good dad. A flawed character, but a good dad. Vito, Vito Corleone from The Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> good dad, not so good person. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. But you know, he did it for his family. Uh, you know, yeah. His heart was in the right place. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he, yeah, he sure. Put, he had, you wanted Michael to be he a lawyer like his brother, but ended up, he turned, up, turned out to be The Godfather. So. <laughs> yeah. And then here's another one. Um, I don't know if we could call him a good dad, but he turned out to be good. He did turn out to be good and, and balance the universe. Mm. Uh, Darth Vader. What? Darth Vader. <laughs> hey, at the very end. At the very end, you know. Well, he had good inside him. But yes. He, his actions weren't good. <laughs> like, the whole way through. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Even when he was a little kid. Yeah. He was a little Bad shit. example. Yeah. <laughs> I hated that kid. At the very end, though. Oh. At, at the very Nobody end. Nobody wanted his backstory. Yeah. Yeah. Just get to the Vader. But at the end, you know, he helped. He killed, you know, the emperor. And then, you know, he helped him out.
I mean, sure. <laughs> I was <laughs> yeah. thinking about yeah. that, too. <laughs> I like the spin on that. Oh, speaking of spin. So, uh, okay. So, you know that sports are, like, coming back, like, uh, the end of July, I guess, yeah, like yeah, the yeah. NBA yeah. and everything. So Super exciting. It's like, yeah, it's, yeah, I know you're real excited about it, but, I mean, me and Adam, like, I mean, we need something. But what's what cracked me up is, I guess, there's been some sports that have tried to, like, still kind of do it, and there's been some, like, soccer games and things happening around the world, but there's no fans uh, and so somebody had this clever idea to start putting cardboard people in the stands. What? And so then this became a business where people would like, they want to support their team. So they take a picture of themselves, print off this cardboard like version of them and place them in these seats. Shut up. Up. And so now this is becoming like it, it was so popular that all these other uh, like NBA and like some other like franchises and NBL and all that are trying to like follow suit and start to place depending on the re- rules and regulations of how many people they could fit they could still supplement get some income in with these cardboard oh, fucking people in there. Wow. My goodness, isn't that crazy? Wow, and I talk about a pivot. I wonder if you if you pay a higher level so you could be front row too. Like yeah, I want my totally. Uh, oh my god, that's totally all. that. And it's, so I mean there's been a few things right there's one uh, co- other company they were trying to do uh wow, like look holograms at that, look at that stadium full of them <laughs> it's it's so silly it's like it, it feel, i feel like we're being punked hey but you know what though i'm not gonna lie if it's uh, for a reasonable price there i do have a, a price point but i mean if, yeah for 25 50 bucks right. like to, to put myself oh, on i want to put chewbacca like you know like in there for somebody <laughs> you know i fully support this movement i'll tell you why could could you imagine if you could do this for like shit you don't want to go to? Like, yeah. oh, it's the wedding on Saturday. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, you know what? Exactly. Send my cardboard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> picture. Send cardboard, Sal. I'll be there at the wedding. Don't yeah, worry. I'm here you in know? spirit. You know, you know what I'm like, saying? Yeah, you could literally do that. Yeah, you just uh, put a picture of yourself. And if, you know what though? This is this is this is one of the things though that I feel like that makes America great, dude. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, it's so innovative, right? We figure a way out to still monetize that people will do. It, it reminds me of remember I told you guys that business that started where because Instagram has become so fake and superficial that you can buy digital clothes, you know, it's not Mm. even real clothes, but they, they put them on you, you know? And so then you have pictures of like these really like cool outfits. That's hilarious. I think it's so crazy. So you just post it with your cool outfit that you never actually wore. Look how expensive this outfit is. I'm going to tell you right now, dude, I predict, I predict people are going to start leaving. If it's not already happening, people are going to start leaving social media. Oh yeah, in droves. It's I, a I think it's already starting to happen, and I predict that that's going to. You be and a I have a little debate on um, this going. I don't. I don't know if I agree with that. I. Mean, I don't. I'm starting to lean in that direction, mainly based off of like everybody that I've talked to that aren't like in my circle here. You know, it's like I, I've been talking to a lot of people about their Instagram accounts or social media, their Twitter, and everybody's like dropping like flies. They're just like, nope, I've stopped paying attention. It's fucking negative. It's. It's uh, a shame. It's all about shame. You get hammered if you say something. You get hammered if you don't say anything. When you go on to look, everything you read is 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 negative. And mm. uh, of course, it's highlighted right now because it's election season. Um, I think people are starting to bounce. I mean, I don't disagree with what you just said right there. The but the it it, it reminds me of like. Um, Jerry Springer and Ricky Lake. It's just like it's just absolute trash TV, yeah. but we still tune in. And You're we right, watch but here's, by the millions. But here's the difference: There's a select group of people that like that. Yeah. The, the rest a of us big, are like, this is bullshit. Hey, bro, a big select. I, <laughs> was, I guess. Not a little bit, no, no, like no. a lot. <laughs> I, no, I agree. I don't think it's going to disappear. I think a lot of people are leaving. But here's the difference: you watch Ricky Lake or Maury Povich or whatever. They are not the audience there isn't hammering you and shaming you for not saying something or mm. saying something. It's become like an, a way to attack each other. Yeah. And this it, it's the, the cancel culture that's going on right now, it's, which well. is crazy, which by the way is uh, I'm telling people right now, it's going to continue to spiral unless we stop it. What people are doing right now yeah. is they're yeah. they're they're judging people's past with the context of today and what we accept today. I'm going to let you guys in on a on a fact. Nobody will will nobody will last that scrutiny. Not a single person on earth right now yeah. will will survive getting scrutinized 
by their past with today's context. Just won't work. Oh, yeah. It's impossible. It will never work that way. No. It'll always evolve and change. Language changes, what's acceptable changes, attitudes and opinions change. Oh, so I told you I had the boys watch Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Oh, yeah. See? How, how Great that? example. They, yeah, so this is like one of those things. I'm like watching it and they're using the F word in there mm-hmm. just like loosely like it was back in the day. And do you think those guys are super homophobic? No. Like, no, it's just that was the time in, in a time capsule of of what was acceptable back then and then and then the culture changed because it was like oh well that's pretty shitty to say that you know yeah. but it that you, there's just examples of that like all throughout our childhood yeah there is and that's why i'm saying if we allow that to continue to happen and you know some of it's i get it i get some of the, the, the reasons why people are motivated to do it but we have to stop the trend because nobody will be safe it'll be used against everybody it'll start to destroy and you'll get to the point where a lot of people right now are afraid of even just being. That's why I think people are leaving social media, mm-hmm. is because people are afraid to even be there for fear of getting uh, you know attacked or whatever, which is it's a stressful time. Well, I've I've been on it like maybe shit eighty percent less than what I was just a month ago, and it's it's not fear. It's just I've it's so such a time suck, and I see how it changes my mood. Totally, mm-hmm. yeah. and I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm the. I talk about all the time about how I evaluate my emotions and my mood going up or down, and I find my attitude changing. I, I get sucked, and then I, and I go look back at myself and go, "Oh my god!" Like I got sucked into two or three hours of going back and forth with somebody on fucking social media. I don't even know who they are. Why do I feel the need to defend myself? You know yeah, what I'm saying? Like, yeah. what, who are they to me? Like, I don't care about those people that are going to say negative things to me or argue with me. Yeah. It's like, I, I, they don't know me. They don't know my character. I mean, I do care about my family, my friends, you guys, people that are close to me that say something totally about Totally different. Yeah, yeah, if you make Whoa. a comment to me about my character, I, I'm going to d- dig into it. Like, oh man, maybe that was wrong well, or not they, right. I look at it too and I... I forget where I heard this, but I totally look at that. This is like an example of when you're in your car, when you're in your car and the stakes are a bit higher and you think everything's like just chill and cool and whatever, but then somebody just kind of cuts you off or does something where, and like you get fucking enraged. Like, like you just think like everybody's out to get you all of a sudden this mm-hmm. road rage is a real thing. I think the, the social media right now, because of like the pandemic, because of like everybody's on high alert, because like all these factors are just poured in at one thing. And it's somebody says one thing. It's like, boom, it's, it's immediate rage. Yeah. You it's, assume yeah. the worst first. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, right now too, what you have, have, uh, I mean, the last election year, um, they they spent the, the just the presidential candidate spent, um, I think, uh, almost two billion dollars. And then when you combine all the other elections that happened, it was something like over three billion dollars in a single year. Mm. And if you think that they're not spending a big portion of that on social media, you're you're a complete uh, moron. Of course they are. So when you're on social media, you what you oftentimes are seeing are are not even real uh, people. Uh, and th- not to mention, it's a very easy system to hack. Mm-hmm. And we know this for a fact that they have people in other countries, like factories of people in other countries whose goals are to go in yep. and to cause you know dissent or issues or cause division. And so it's just a very... It's not the real world. Let me put it to that way. It's yeah. definitely not the real world. And that's the thing is you go talk to somebody in person and you have a completely different feeling and energy mm-hmm. from everybody. Well, again, I, you know, I know, we're supposed to mention um, our partner, Ned, right now. They're, they're, they make hemp oil. And I'll tell you what. Well, I could use some right now. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. You know, if, if And I know a lot of people are, are feeling this way because I, I, I've, I've had people DM me and ask me about this. But if you're feeling a higher level of you know, anxiety um, and, and stress, first of all, your behaviors um, and your perceptions change based on your how you feel and your emotions, right? So if you're in a really happy, good mood, you tend to have a filter that is more patient and open and empathetic uh, and understanding. If you're scared or anxious, you tend to have a filter that sees more threat and sees more, uh, more things are scary and you may react a little stronger and it kind of feeds itself. And so if you're feeling really anxious, one of the best things you could do is is try to alleviate at least the physical symptoms of anxiety. So you might not be able to solve the thoughts through your mind, but at least change the way your body physically feels. So things like meditation, uh, belly breathing, um, turning off all electronics for a few hours, going outside, 
being in nature, going for walks. And then you can use natural uh, products, uh, full spectrum hemp oil extract, like the one that Ned makes. Legit, I mean, it legit does provide that. Like you take a dose of that and you feel your physical anxiety kind of come down. Mm-hmm. And then that helps with the other aspect of it. Because now you don't have that physical feeling of anxiety that tends to cause that negative uh, filter. A little bit of Ned in nature for me. Uh, I just, I, I love going and, and going for hikes and getting sun and just being out there. It does wonders for my mental health. Totally, totally. By the way, uh, I'm going to talk about a fitness study because uh, that's our that's the topic that we know most about. A study <laughs> came out on protein oh, distribution. Yeah. So they actually tested uh, groups of men to see uh, what kind of protein distribution would cause the best gains in terms of strength and muscle. Mm-hmm. And the one that, and by the way, this is splitting hairs. This wasn't a huge difference, but it was a difference that they could measure. Very small, but still there. And they found that a a, a high protein breakfast um, and then two more protein meals was better than a low protein breakfast and two other protein meals. So stay, starting your day off with a high protein mm-hmm. breakfast seems to have uh, better effects on muscle growth and now, strength. what do you think? What do you think is uh, what's your theory on that? Do you think it's because you've been fasted for eight or nine hours, and so the, just the bodies need to have it in the system, and then just by having a nice, good, loaded breakfast full of protein? I think so, because I think what happens is, and we've seen this in studies, if you have too frequent of protein feedings, like you eat protein every every other hour, um, you start to see protein synthesis go down. It's as if your body becomes desensitized to the protein. Mm. Um, so I think that fasted period of sleep, and then you have a lot of protein, you have a higher protein synthesis spike. That's my theory yeah. as to why that would be. But again, it's splitting hairs. But if you're one of those like hardcore athletes and you train your butt off and your diet's perfect, and so you're looking for every little piece of you know anything that can give you a boost, right. I would say try that out. Well, I think that's good. If, even if you're not like this high-performance athlete or like super serious about building a ton of muscle, just because... Uh, it most of the clients, and we've talked about this before, that I train uh, had a hard time, especially my females, had a hard time getting enough protein that their body needs, much less for performance or for building muscle. They were already under consuming. And one of the things that I would always give as advice is getting a jump start on the amount in the day mm. it, early on, like getting ahead of it early so you don't feel like, oh, crap, you look at your watch, it's 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's like, oh, I've had 10 grams of protein mm-hmm. today, mm-hmm. and then now you're trying to cram it all in the back. So, I mean, that's just great because it supports already that we should be eating more a bulk of it. Plus, I think it just helps people getting there. So, I mean, I had like little hacks for me where – you know, Katrina and I, we use a lot of ground ground turkey and chicken and beef and, you know, all my meats for like our dinners. I We always cook in bulk or more than enough for us just to eat that serving. And then I save and I always like mix whatever that is scrambled with eggs or an mm-hmm. egg over it. Like it just, I think it's just a, an easy way to boost protein because when you look at like uh, what we've uh, made popular breakfast foods, they're carb heavy. It's all mm-hmm. like, let's it's, spike your sugar, your blood yeah, sugar levels. That was kind of, the, you know, the, the the pancakes and the cereals and toast, like everything is so, you know, oatmeal, everything is so carb heavy for mm-hmm. breakfast. There's very few things that have a lot of protein in it. So I've just gotten the habit of like normally whatever dinner is, I just like pair it with, with eggs in it and it t- makes it feel like it's a breakfast. You know, it's funny. Uh, yeah. Some psychologists actually recommend a high fat, high protein breakfast for people who have um, anxiety issues because they found that the spike in blood sugar that you might get in the morning when you eat like a high sugar breakfast mm. tends to spark uh, you know, more anxiety throughout the day. And they found that giving people a lower sugar, lower carbohydrate, higher fat, higher protein breakfast gives them uh, less of that. So that's like one of those things. Mm. Speaking of timing, I uh, reminded myself last week uh, of how much uh, morning workouts really suck. <laughs> so I, I never, I almost- I've, ne- I've known this. Yeah. For a long you know, time, I know it too, but you, you forget just how much until you have a contrast. Ah. So for a long time, I, I work out in the morning. And the reason why I work out in the morning is not because I love working out in the morning. Just got to get it in. Yes, if I don't do it, if I don't start my day with my workout, then my consistency falls off. So I've just decided I'm going to work out at 630 in the morning. And through doing so, I will be consistent. And it's true. It actually helps uh, a lot with consistency. So I almost never work out in the afternoon. Well, last week on Friday, we got out of here a little early and I knew ahead of time that that was going to happen. So I thought, you know what? I haven't had like an afternoon workout in a long time. So I went home 
and uh, I lifted and it was like 1 p.m. And I was an animal. I was a total, and you know what, it, re- it made me, so I've been thinking to myself like, man, maybe I'm just getting older. Like I'm working out in the morning and like my stamina sucks and my strength isn't as good as it used to be. And I kind of started, but because I've been doing it for so long, I kind of start, I chalked it up to like, I'm just getting older or whatever. No, man, it's because I work out in the morning. Yeah. yeah. I work out in the afternoon. Yeah. I got oh. nothing in the tank in the mornings, dude. Neither do I. It's dude, the worst. Dude, I had a monster workout. I was doing a, a farmer walks with 405. I was benching like an idiot and, and overhead pressing and just feeling like my old self. Yeah. But I can't make that time work. Well, I told you that when I was competing, I, it, you know, because of measuring and tracking and manipulating so much stuff and being so consistent with that for so long, that I really pieced it. I, I figured out like the formula, like how many calories, how much protein, how much carbs, like I need to eat or not I need, but that to get the best workout. And it was, and I tried it and practiced like multiple times of, oh, let me, remember when you, it was when you guys were doing, or when we first started on the show talking about fasting. Yeah. Uh-huh. I remember I was when I was always pushing back because you guys were like, man, I feel so much better fasted. I'm like, okay, I feel good. Like I don't feel bloated. I, my, I feel like I can go and I'm yeah. fine. I get my workout, but it is not the same as me getting a good 12 to 1500 calories, a good 50 to 70 grams of protein and a good 200 grams of carbs in the day before I go into a lift. I get all of that and like midday too, before I start to slow mm-hmm. down the afternoon and that nothing fuels a workout better than that for me. Yeah. And because oh, yeah. we're, you know, we're so consistent with it. You can tell these differences. You can really, you know, feel them out. First question is from Fit Trucker Lady. Are booty bands or hip circles effective for building the butt? What would be the correct way to use a booty band? Mm. Oh, those have been real popular uh, lately, you know, with people, especially for butt building. So here's the thing. Booty bands, hip circles. So for those people who don't know what those are, those are literally elastic bands. Some of them uh, made out of material. Some of them actually made out of like a like a rubber or whatever you wear it around your legs and then you do uh, movements that work the the muscles that separate your legs or work your glutes with them on their own they're not very effective at building any muscle at all in if you take them and put them in a program and use them p- properly they are very effective mm. so the way that i would use them is i would use them as a primer I would use them to get someone to feel what it feels like to activate the glutes, to activate the glutes a little bit, and then move the person to the real butt building exercises, which are like your squats and your deadlifts and your hip thrusts. That's how I would primarily use the booty bands. Yeah, I've always used these uh, mainly as a warm-up primer. Uh, We'd call it like tube walking, but we would do this ahead of time in order to get the glutes to respond and you'd be able to feel that in your squats and in your lifts uh, throughout. So, I mean, it's very effective for that uh, if you haven't done that before. But you do see a lot on social media people selling these and they're obviously they're trying to sell them as like the the one stop shop of like building your booty and like this is all you have to do it's it's the same thing with the donkey kickbacks the dog peas like all these like exercises that have like a little bit of uh, relevance on their own in terms of like activation of the glutes, but they're not building. They're, they're literally just like getting you connected to your glutes. Uh, and, and it's a great one to add into for, uh, you know, you know, more, more volume in terms of frequency of being able to approach uh, that specific muscle group. I, I think it's an, an amazing tool, but unfortunately it's, it's rare that I think I see uh, people using it well. Uh, it's, it's turned into that, where when I go in the gyms now, they're everywhere, right? They've been definitely marketed to people a lot. And it's obviously why we have this question, but everybody uses them like um, these pumping exercises, you know? So they're doing, they're, they're doing all these pumping, like, you know, uh, kickbacks with it, or they're opening, they're doing uh, jump squats and they're wearing them. They're doing all these weird movements while they keep the band on during the entire time. And then you have another group of people that are wearing them while they're doing squats, which is not bad, But the idea is that you're just trying to prime and wake up the glutes, right? So we've talked about this before when like one of the most common things that people do when they squat is their feet pronate, meaning they flatten and the knees collapse in. Well, the muscles that are responsible for that, the knees pushing out is your side butt. 
So if I put a band around my knees and I have to push out against the band, basically what it's doing is it's telling me to like that part of my, like turn that part of my butt on. And so, and then people really feel it when they do the squats with the bands on the knees. And what happens a lot of times with exercise is we think that because we feel it, it's, it's a more effective exercise. So that, that was a, and this was a mistake I remember making as a trainer is like, if it was something that they really felt like, oh, that's a better exercise than another exercise just because that person feels it better. But that's not necessarily true. Like it would be far better if that person just learned intrinsically how to turn that part of their butt on while they squat. And if you always have a band around your knees, you're not teaching yourself to do that. So you, you know, the guys are alluding to priming. You do it before your exercise. You do your tube walks or you do these exercises with the band on, not going to fatigue, not tons of sets, tons of reps, just enough to get you like established connecting. They're like, oh, okay, I feel that. I feel my side butt. Okay, now let's go and squat without the band, but now think about that. Now think about what we're trying to do by forcing your knees out, not letting them collapse in while you sweat. You want to teach your body to be able to do it. Otherwise, you got to wear a stupid band around your knees mm -hmm. everywhere you go just to feel it in your butt the same way. Yeah, now the, now the way I would use something like this in the past, you can use it for correctional exercise, which is what I think people are doing but thinking that they're building their butt more. And that was what, you know, what, what Adam just talked about where let's say your knees collapse in and cave in when you do a squat. Well, one way you would help correct this for someone is you would have them push their knees out against something that they, that would provide some resistance like a band or sometimes I wouldn't even use a band. I would use a rope or something that didn't even stretch. I'd put it around the legs, have them push out and then squat. Now, the reason why I would do that was it would, it would teach them to, to push the knees out while performing a movement. It's correctional exercise. Correctional exercise is great for correcting movement patterns. It's like it, training wheels. Right, but it's not great for building lots of muscle. Now, it can help you build lots of muscle because if you correct your form, then you go lift heavy, then you build lots of muscle. So that's how you should use this. You should use this to activate the glutes better, correct your positioning in your form, then the goal is to not use it anymore, take it off, now go do your deadlifts, now go do your squats, now do your sumo, sumo deadlifts, now do your hip thrusts, and then watch what happens. Next question is from Sophie Christine Fox. Are rest days actually important or can you do hard exercise seven days a week? Uh, this is a mistake that I think I made for such a long time. Well, it would just mm. going Train, hard all the yeah, time. Yeah, going hard all the time. Yeah, and yeah. I, you know, again, we talk on the show all the time about these, you know, paradigm shattering moments for us and you know, it, it, this was a hard one to get through to somebody who likes to train, right? If you don't like training and you're like, it's hard to get you to the gym two or three times a week. Yeah. This is this. Like I, I take five rest days a week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, this conversation is not for you, but this is for somebody who loves to train, loves the sweat, loves the burn, loves to feel sore from the next day because they worked out really hard, could go to the gym every single day because they like it so much. It This conversation is important because- I was someone like this for a really long time where I love to work out and I love to work out hard and long. And, you know, I was always chasing, you know, harder, harder and sore and sore. And what ends up happening, and, and Sal talks about this a lot with the, you know, you get stuck in this recovery trap. You know, you're sending the signal to the body to try and adapt, but because you're sore all the time and you're hammering it, your body's trying to recover and you're never giving it enough recovery that it never gets to fully adapt and see its full potential. And I remember going, you know, thinking like, oh, is this guy who wants to build muscle, be stronger, be bigger, more, more, more. And then be then actually scaling back to three or four days. And I and I just my strength went up. I built more muscle and it blew my mind because I'm like, this is crazy. I feel like I'm working less. I know I'm working less. I'm going from seven down to four. And I know I'm not as sore, but yet now I'm seeing more results than I've ever seen before. Yeah. Yeah. I look at it too, like if for an example, if you look at calluses on your hands and you're constantly holding something and it's just slightly kind of ripping at your skin and, you know, you got a couple more days where, you know, you're putting the effort back in and then it starts to really start to tear and tear to, to the point where it rips it completely off. And now I'm starting over again. Like I'm just healing. I'm trying to heal my skin now to just build and develop the skin 
to to come back, uh, uh, you know, to to replace that. Versus, I could have stopped and allowed my skin to heal, and then it's going to create a callus, which is basically, you know, in this case for building muscle, that's what we want to build muscle. We want to give it just, you know, the right amount of uh, of dose of stimulus for it to be able to be stimulated to grow. But now we also have to create the opportunity for it to heal and build and grow. And I think that the, the, the rest and the recovery part of it, I mean, this is not something that's marketed enough. This is not something that's been out there. Uh, you know, when people are training, they don't think, okay, well, how can I optimize my rest and recovery to be able to help me in my building muscle process? That's just not a conversation that's been uh, put out there very often. So I think that's, we, we kind of lean towards that a lot because of, especially I'm with Adam, I've definitely been on the intensity and, and working out. That's the most important part of the whole piece. And that's, that's what's, you know, crammed into athletes minds specifically is how hard you're working in, and, and that's going to translate into the best work, uh, that's going to produce the best body and the best results. But unfortunately that's not the case. The human body, it needs that opportunity to grow and, and, and that, and rest is part of that. Yeah. It's because the, the rest and recovery part involves a lot of your body doing its thing and you're not really sitting there, you know, recovering, you know what I'm saying? So we tend to place more value on the tear down part, on the send the signal part, and less value on the recovery part because what are you doing when you're recovering? I don't know. What are you doing when you're working out? Oh, I'm in the gym. I'm busting my butt. I'm sweating. I'm getting sore. So we place more more value on that. By the way, you can actually you can work out every day or exercise, I should say, every day. Yeah, the key is they say hard here. Seven Correct. Days a week. Yeah, yeah, you got it's about it's about the intensity because your body recovers great when you're moving. So you might have four hard workouts a week, but your the other two or three days involve stretching and mobility and hiking and walking and just generally being active, but nothing too intense. Your body actually recovers pretty good uh, doing that. In fact, some people recover better that way. I do. I recover faster and better when I'm active than when I'm doing absolutely. You know, when I, I used to think when I was a kid, I had to like do nothing. So I, you know, I started working out. I was fourteen. Yeah, I lay on the couch, and I yeah. learned. I learned about recovery real early because I'd read all these books and articles. So I thought, oh, recovery. That means don't do anything. Let my body build. So I'd like lift real heavy, and then I'd do nothing. I'd just sit on the couch, and like wait for my muscles to build or whatever. <laughs> you actually do better when you're when you're moving, but the intensity needs to be modified. Here's the other thing too: um, just because you can doesn't mean you should. What right. I mean by that is, and this is a lesson I learned as well. I used to think to myself like, oh, I'm fine. I can I can go to the gym seven days a week and train hard and I'm okay. I can keep doing it. Well, yeah, but that might not be optimal, you know? And, and how do you know it's optimal? How did I know it was optimal? Because I would, something would happen and I'd have to take a couple days off uh, unwillingly and I'd go back to the gym and I was stronger. And this happened enough times to where I said, why am I stronger when I take two days off from the gym? That doesn't make any sense. I thought I had to be in the gym every single day. Then I started to piece it together and say, oh, okay. It's because I have to give my body a chance to catch up. Remember, recovery is like healing, and healing is different than adaptation. Adaptation goes above and beyond the healing process. So you got to let your body heal, but then you also got to let your body adapt, overcompensate, if you will. If you don't do that, then all you're doing is you're, you're, you're giving your, your body's just healing all the time. It's healing, and it never progresses you go to the gym and you're the same strength. You look in the mirror and you look the same. Nothing improves even though you're working out like crazy. Now, to be fair, uh, knowing your goal is important for us too, right? Because I guess you could be somebody who just wants to be resilient as fuck, right? You don't care about building any more muscle. You don't care about burning any more body fat. You just want to be able to handle and be take punishment sure. like that. And you want your body to adapt and be able to handle yeah, that. Yeah, like if you're a soldier or yeah, something Yeah, exactly. Like that, like yeah. What comes to mind, you know, uh, who's really popular on Instagram, who I was thinking of when you were just talking right now, made me bring this point up, is um, I think his handle is real world tactical. Yeah, I know who that is. Right? Yeah, the big Samoan looking dude. Right. Yeah. I mean, so I was like envisioning like his training protocol and I, like probably how many millions of kids that are trying to do the same shit. Oh, that, God. That, how that, would you do what he does? Right. Like, well, as a maniac. That shouldn't be, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. he, but this guy is like, he's training to be like to take punishment like to be able to be out there tactical and doing stuff and be able to take an ass whoop and still be able to fire his gun and still be able to run a mile after all of it like that's different like training your body to adapt to handle resiliency like that and be able to take on and hammer it and still get back up and go again yeah. 
totally different than somebody who's like, I want to build the most muscle. I want to burn the most body fat, or I want to shape my body to look a certain way. There's, it's a whole different approach. So if you are training seven days a week and you have a job or like you're a soldier, like you said, there's difference there. I mean, that that then there's value to somebody. There's also the mental training that comes. That's from, what I mean. Yeah. There's there's mental resiliency that comes with that, mm -hmm. and when that is when that's a higher priority than building, because there's still the same rules apply. If I'm training a soldier. If he said, I want to build 10 pounds of muscle, there's still a better approach than hammering him seven days a week. Mm -hmm. But if I had a soldier who's just like, I already have the body I want. I don't need any more muscle. I don't need, it, but I need to be able to take the fucking worst thing you could throw at me because I want to be prepared for whatever the worst thing I might get out there. So give it to me. Okay. Well, then that, that, that has a little bit of value. Then it's different for that person. But I mean, we're talking about a very small person. Yeah. Actually, I used to, uh, you know, I, I trained some pretty high level, um, you know, military people uh, at, at one point. And they told me that the, you know, like, let's say you want to become a SEAL. Everybody who's, in, who's invited in that can, can pass, they're all fit enough to pass it. It's the ones that have the mental resilience mm -hmm. that end up passing, and the rest are the ones that break mentally. So the whole goal behind that isn't to make them the fittest; it's to see who breaks right. and who can who can withstand it. Next question is from Jay Emke. I have some nagging pain in my knees and shoulders, which goes away when I work on those areas in the gym, but comes back the next day. Why does it feel better when I'm working on these areas versus when I'm resting them? There's a classic case mm, good question. of poor uh, recruitment patterns and bad movement patterns. So when you start to move a muscle and, you know, quote unquote, warm it up, um, you do get some, some localized painkillers that get released from that, in that area. Um, there's receptors in the muscles and in the body that can actually that will you know you get an analgesic effect yeah they send pain but you you start to release these painkillers as you start to miss it this is an evolutionary trait right mm -hmm. it's like if you start to move and you need to be able to move that your body's like okay let's numb the pain right so that We're you can localize this continue yeah. to move um, the other thing too is as you're doing the exercises you might temporarily improve your movement pattern within that workout so now you start to feel better but if you don't change those movement patterns uh, permanent then you're going to start to have pain later on. Now, this part of, I had something like this with uh, really bad tennis elbow. This is back when I was doing a lot of jujitsu and judo, which involved lots of gripping um, on the gi. And I started to get really, really sore, you know, elbows. This is the top of the forearm, right? Where the forearm muscles attach at the elbow. So it's like the sides of the elbows. And it was just, it was so nasty. It was so painful. And it would take me like 15 minutes into my workout to not feel them anymore. But then, you know, later on when I cooled down and everything, the pain came back. Came back. So what I had to do was some correctional exercise. I had to do some myofascial release or some deep tissue massage to solve it uh, permanently. Otherwise, it was always this 15-minute warm-up before I could, you know, start to feel better. So that's kind of what's happening to you. I would say focus on correctional exercise for a little while to fix yeah. this problem. In, in my experience, a lot of times this is, you know, just joint stability. Right. So when you, especially when you're talking about the knee and the shoulder, so you're talking about a, a floating joint and then a ball and socket joint where very easily those can be off just a tiny bit. So you've got all these muscles around those two joints that help support it and are supposed to be keeping it in the, in the perfect position. But in reality, it's never like that. In reality, we're all kind of imbalanced a little bit. And so that joint is not in an optimal po position or is not being supported by all the muscles. So there's a lot of instabi instability in that joint. And that causes like this bone on bone rubbing sometimes and causes this chronic achy pain. Then you start working out and all those muscles that are surrounding that joint get woken up and now are working. And now it kind of holds it in place and then it doesn't hurt anymore so much. Yeah. So I've that's what I normally experience is a lot of times the clients just don't have really good stability and control in that joint. This is what Prime Prime and Prime Pro is all about is getting you to kind of activate all those muscles that support those joints. Yeah, and this is why I'm always reiterating the importance of repeating uh, those good patterns as much as possible. And that's why we have that in the program is, yeah, you've done the exercise, but it doesn't just stop there. It's something you got to be conscious of throughout the day because I'll have clients that will end up back, you know, revert back to their, you know, their their other position where uh, they're not paying attention to their posture. They're not pay, paying attention to the way that they're lifting objects uh, just around their house. Uh, but they are very 
present in the workout. And so they're able to then, you know, adjust their, their posture. They're able to adjust and, and squeeze specific muscles to create that stability, which you talk about. And so you, you they don't, ex, they don't feel the pain, uh, you know, in the workout quite as much, but then, you know, th- when they go back to their re- everyday life, uh, th- they don't address those things in their, their own lifestyle. And so this is where it kind of sneaks back and never really gets solved or, or addressed. And so this is a, this is a root issue uh, that that really needs a lot more attention than you think. Uh, to to be able to repeat uh, these these specific types of movements as much as possible it doesn't have to be super intense either. It's just on your mind constantly. Uh, you know, for weeks, months, you know, even a year sometimes, depending how severe uh, you know this pattern is hardwired. In, you know, into your mindset. And it's very normal for to see this creep in and out of your life forever. Like, so I, I'm dealing with stuff on my left shoulder right now of the same. And I know that I know that it's a, a stability issue. And so I'm doing all this work right now to, to regain it. And I can't tell you, and which frustrates the shit out of me, being somebody who's so in tune with his body to have this. And I know these guys can relate. Like, there's nothing worse than this being our our wheelhouse and then getting like nagging pain and then uh, trying yeah. to be able to like, mm-hmm. what the hell? Why is this bothering me right now? Now, I know the things I need to be doing, but like Justin's saying, there's something going on in my lifestyle that's caused that that instability and that it's causing this nagging pain in my shoulder that I need to get to the bottom of so I don't so I don't have anymore. And it's the exact same feeling too. When I get into my shoulder workout, it's my shoulder that bothers me. Once I start working my shoulders, it goes away for the workout and then it doesn't start to come back till later on. And I know that I've got to put more work into getting myself in a better alignment, getting better shoulder stability, which is all of our shoulder mm-hmm. stuff in Sign Prime Pro. Next question is from Amped Heart. How much do you guys cycle in and out of your healthiest self? How often do you fall off of your workouts or diet plan? How often do you fall off your workout or diet plan, which I just said? <laughs> I <laughs> typed it twice. Reiterate it. Yeah. How extreme does the pendulum swing and how long do these periods last? What are your first steps to get yourself back on track? That's a lot right there. Yeah, Yeah. it's it's an interesting um, um, question. So, all right, a couple things. Uh, Number one, if you have the mindset of, you know, being good to yourself and taking care of yourself, the pendulum is not going to have a lot of huge swing. You're typically going to, you're going to have a pendulum swing, but it's not going to be really, really big. Here's the other thing you want to consider. You got to consider context. My healthiest self is different if I am in a situation where life is very, very stressful versus when life is not very stressful versus when something happens that's terrible or something happens that's great. I mean, you know, I had uh, somebody very close to me pass away years ago. My healthiest self then I could not compare to the context of today where I didn't don't have that happening. Obviously, I'm going to be a lot healthier today than I was back then. But back then, I was doing pretty good when I considered you know what was what was going on. I have a baby that's coming in October. My healthiest self during the you know first few months or year of that situation is probably going to be different than it is before I had uh, an infant or after they turn three or four years old or five years old or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that's something you want to you want to look at as well. Now that being said, if you find that you have this wide pendulum swing. If you find that you you fluctuate between fit, healthy, mobile, feeling good, and 30, 40, 50 pounds overweight and feeling terrible, well, yeah, you definitely need to look um, at you know what's happening and why you're finding yourself in a you know all in or all out uh, mm-hmm. type of situation. My uh, you know I believe most of that comes from the fact that you're not the, the root driver for you hating yourself is not coming from the right place i think you're yeah. you're probably getting fit because you're disgusted with how bad the pendulum swing at one point but then you get sick of hating yourself in which case you jump off that point and you say screw it i just want to live my life and enjoy myself in which case the pendulum swings the other, and it just cycles back and forth i love this question um justin you picked this question yeah yeah uh-huh. i really like this question because i've actually thought about this a lot um and more so than and it's because it's funny what's exactly what sal brought up right yeah he's about to go into having a kid i know that um, I'm for sure i am not the fittest version of myself but why i find it an interesting question and why i've thought about it a lot is because there are there are many different things that uh, to, to measure health 
uh, it's different than my body fat percentage. That's only one marker. Mm -hmm. That's only one marker that 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 falls in there, right? And th and that can be an actual pretty wide range, you know. And for me, I'd say that range is somewhere between nine and fifteen percent. You know, I would consider myself, you know, a body fat percentage, quote unquote, healthy in that range. So that's a that's a, a pretty wide range I can go. But then there's other factors that I would consider myself healthy or unhealthy. My stress, my sleep. Uh, my relationship with my partner, my relationship with my family, my relationships with my business, my my financial health. Like there's a lot of other markers in my life that that dictate how healthy I am. Mm -hmm. And I and it's kind of crazy because it's hard to say. Like there's parts of me that actually think that I'm the healthiest I've ever been in my life right now. But I'm definitely not the fittest I've ever been. Mm -hmm. But when I think about where I'm at in my relationship, having a like a whole new purpose, like I have a different purpose in my life that's given me a different focus and drive that makes me feel very makes me feel more healthy about my financial, makes me feel more healthy about my future. Like so there's a lot of things that you have to really consider. And unfortunately, we put everything on, you know, in the fitness space, we put everything on the way we look. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And like everybody for sure who's physique. who's known me for five years would say, Adam is definitely not as fit as he was five years ago. But I would tell you that I think I'm healthier. I mm -hmm. think I'm a lot healthier. I think I have a, I, I'm not having to weigh and measure food. I've got a very nice, good balance. I've, I haven't put any, I don't, I definitely haven't had long periods of time where I'm not exercising and strength training. And there's a lot of energy and focus that's actually been put into other areas in my life that maybe weren't as healthy when I was training and at the best body fat percentage. So, you know, there's a lot to, to, to consider. And so, for all those things, I'm always kind of looking at any of them that I think they get out of. And just like the body fat percentage, there's a there's a uh, there's a nine to fifteen percent range for my uh, relationships. There's a nine to fifteen percent range for my uh, family. There's a nine to fifteen range for my finances. If that does that make sense? Like, like the pendulum swings, but like like with body fat percentage, it's between nine exactly. And 15%. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, let's talk about finances. Like, there's uh, there's parts of me that says, hey, I, I should be. I work really hard. I should be able to enjoy some of that, but then I should also be some responsible. I have other people that I'm taking care of. So I might allow myself to spend a little bit more than usual, but right around 15%, I reel it back in like, okay, this is getting a little out of control. This is irresponsible of me. This isn't very healthy. Mm -hmm. Pull it back a little bit. Same thing goes for if I'm being so goddamn tight with money where I don't spend on anything, I'm being a miser about everything. It's like, listen, part of the reason why I work so hard is so we can enjoy some of the finer things in life. That's me being down at like seven, eight percent body yeah, fat, yeah. right? So I look at like all of these parts uh, that I consider the the whole spectrum of health and I give myself a 9 to 15% body fat range or a 9 to 15 range in all aspects and just try and keep a, a nice good view of all of it. And, you know, it's not like a big deal when uh, my first steps of getting back, they're not dramatic either. It's not like if I if I'm let's talk about body fat since it's, this is fitness and everyone probably thinks of that first. When I start to see myself get towards that upper end, you know, I, I know it's because I've been allowing things that are probably not the healthiest thing in my diet more frequently. And, you know, instead of going cold turkey everything or going from that extreme to, okay, now I'm weighing and measuring and now I'm training seven days a week, I just... I start to move it back a little bit by cutting out some of those things that are less healthy and making better choices, whether that be exercising more or making less bad choices. And I really feel that way about all those aspects of my life. And 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 only you can dictate that. Only you know uh, how you value all those other things that make you, quote unquote, healthy. Yeah, I look at it all as it's just a dance, you know? And it, it's just something that I'm constantly evaluating where my homeostasis is, where I'm currently at, and then how I can pour myself in a different direction. All those things you mentioned, finance, finance, family, uh, you know, the way that my body looks, the way that my body's performing, uh, the overall stress that I'm allowing myself to uh, accumulate. Uh, am I getting enough sleep? Uh, and so it, it's it's a matter of like constant self assessment and uh, seeing where I where my tendencies tend to lie uh, and then how I can address those things uh, one at a time and then see how that affects the the whole always how it affects the whole because there's always going to be a, a bit of a deficiency in one direction and now it's like okay how do I how do I get myself to even that back out and and so it's just I'm just weaving in and out two steps forward two steps back two steps forward, two steps back. I'm doing the two-step constantly. And so that's my dance. Yeah. It, 
this is why it's so important to have a good relationship with uh, with exercise and nutrition because both of them can be molded and sh- and shift and shape uh, to fit the context uh, of your life. I mean, talk about a workout for a second. You know, um, are there ways I can work out when my performance is at its peak? Yes. Are there ways I can work out and train when I'm injured? Yes. Are there ways I can work out when my performance is down? Yes. Um, I can modify my workouts based on the context of what's going on and how I'm feeling, which always changes. Life is always changing. Nothing ever stays the same. Same thing with nutrition. I'll feed myself uh, according to that as well. And so that's why it's so important to have a good relationship. People talk about balance all the time, right? You need to have balance. What, what, the, what the hell does balance mean? <laughs> yeah. You know, balance, in my opinion, what balance actually means is you're doing things for the right reasons. So if I'm, if I'm working for the wrong reasons, let's say I'm working because I'm insecure about not having money, uh, I'm not going to have any balance. That's the wrong reason. Now, what if I work to find uh, a little bit of purpose in my life and in order to support my family so I can have uh, you know better times with my family and provide for my family? Um, then I'm probably going to have better balance with my work. Same thing with your workouts. Same thing with your, your nutrition. If you're working out and eating because you can't stand the way you look or you don't like yourself, you're not going to have any balance with those things. Now, if you train because you take you, you care about yourself, you go to the, when you go to the gym or you're about to work out at home and you ask yourself, "All right, how can I take care of myself right now?" Like that's going to direct you in the right direction. It's going to create some balance. I can pretty much guarantee that when I have this new baby that comes, my sleep is going to be off. I know I have two kids. I know what it's like to go through that. I know I'm not going to get good sleep. I know I'm not going to walk into my garage and think to myself, today I'm going to hit a PR on my yeah. deadlift. I'm going to go in the garage and be like, okay, I need to, to keep my body moving, keep it healthy so that I can maintain my sanity so I can be there for my my wife and for my infant and for my kids. So that's the that's the approach I'm going to have uh, when I exercise. That's how you develop that balance in your life. And what you'll end up finding is that that swing isn't that big. You know, Adam used the numbers 9 and 15. I mean, that's kind of where I live in between those. Sometimes my body fat goes up a little higher. And, and why is it going up higher? Because, uh, because of balance. There's other things in my life that are more important for my overall health than being at, you know, 9% body fat. Sometimes it goes in the opposite direction. Sometimes think life is working out a certain way to where I can really focus on getting super shredded and I get some value out of that. But you got to have that attitude if you plan on, you know, being your best self or maintaining good health for the rest of your life. It has to be that way. Everything changes at some point. If you're lucky, you get old. At some point, you're going to run into all kinds of different obstacles. And if you don't understand this, you will fail at some point. some point, your life is going to get so different that you're going to say to yourself, screw it, I can't keep keep up this workout. Screw this diet. I can't do it. I'm too stressed out or you know, it, it doesn't work for me right now. My work is too, too hard. And that's when you have those wild pendulum swings. So balance is important and, and don't and always think of context. Your healthiest self involves a lot more than just uh, how shredded and muscular and strong you are. Uh, Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. You can come check us out on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast, and watch the podcast while you listen. Also, if you want to check out some of our free information, we have a lot of guides uh, that we publish. You can find those at mindpumpfree.com. And finally, if you want to find all of us individually on social media, We're all on Instagram for the time being. I'm not going to tell you guys if we're going to be there forever, but right now you can find us there. You can find Justin (laughs) at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Hurry before it's too late.